Hey everybody. So we are going to resume our environmental science lecture course here uh, with a discussion of renewable energy resources. Uh, we already talked a lot about non-renewable resources and um, now we'll continue uh, with some of the other options that we have. So let's get right into it. All right, as a reminder, uh, non-renewable resources are those that will run out or deplete over time. Um, that's why we call them non-renewable. They will not be renewed by the Earth anytime soon. So we are consuming them faster than the Earth can make them. They're going to run out one day. And coincidentally, these also happen to produce uh, pollution and waste. Uh, and our examples of non-renewable resources for energy are things like coal, oil, and gas, which we talked about in a previous video. Uh, these are all things that we dig up out of ground and burn and use either to make electricity or to power our motor vehicles, planes, trains, automobiles, that kind of thing. Uh, the one that we haven't talked about is nuclear. That's because it's not something that you burn. Uh, nuclear energy depends on radioactive substances. Uh, these are elements that we find on Earth, such as uranium, that's the main one that's used. And these radioactive substances basically just release energy, uh, particularly if you have them in high concentrations. So pretty much it's a rock that gives off energy. <laughs> that's a very simple way to put it. And then we can harness that heat that it produces uh, to heat up some steam and to spin a turbine and generate electricity. Uh, so today we're going to cover the other ones, which are the renewable ones. These are in concept resources that will never deplete. Uh, we are not going to run out of these things. And coincidentally, these happen to be cleaner. Uh, forms of energy. So there is no real air pollution or water pollution or any of that stuff uh, produced by these kinds of energies. And wind, solar, and hydro would be the main big ones. And then some of the more kind of experimental or more rare ones are things like tidal, wave, and geothermal energy. And I will run through and kind of explain how all of those work. So we'll start with hydro. Uh, hydroelectric energy, uh, basically how this works is we harness the energy of moving water to spin a turbine. And remember, if you can make something spin, you can make electricity. I can, uh, can jump back to a previous lesson in that. Uh, let's see if I can make this spin and create electricity here. So you can see that all I had to do is spin. There's a magnet in here. There's a coil of wire. As the magnet spins inside the coil of wire, it makes electricity. So basically what happens is that uh, the way you create hydroelectric energy, you block off a river with a dam and you have a big gradient here, a very steep slope, an artificial kind of steep slope that you've created. Uh, between water that's really up high here and really low here. And so when you open up these little gates, uh, water comes down really fast out of here. You basically created like an artificial waterfall. Kind of how it works. And the water, as it's moving really, really fast, you can run it through a turbine like this. It's kind of like a boat propeller. And as the water is rushing through this chamber, uh, because it wants to rush downhill, um, it spins this turbine and if you can make something spin you can make electricity uh, so that is how hydroelectric dams work anytime you see a dam chances are it is a hydroelectric dam in the world uh, and this is the leading renewable resource uh, in the world a uh, source of energy and electricity um, pretty much everywhere and there's some really neat ones uh, this is the Taipu dam I'm not sure if I'm saying that right uh, this is on the border of Brazil and I think it's Uruguay, um, could be Paraguay, uh, it's one of those two. And you can see this is a massive dam feature, blocks off an enormous section of water. And 
this running water right here is what's generating all this electricity. And this particular uh, dam actually powers, I think, the entire electrical grid of Paraguay or Uruguay, which one? Uh, one of those. And it powers a significant chunk of Brazil's electric grid as well. So uh, these can be extremely powerful and extremely useful energy resources. Moving on to wind energy, a similar concept here. Uh, instead of using moving water to spin a turbine, you're move, using moving air. So as air is passing over these blades, the blades are designed to kind of create uh, a push in one direction and they begin spinning, basically a pinwheel. Uh, on a normal year, we actually make these in class. I got my dogs here today. They were distracting me. Hey, what are you doing? Hmm? What are you doing out there? Stop making noises. Oh, no. So as air is moving across this turbine, basically it starts spinning. Um, this is uh, the fastest growing renewable energy, particularly here in Texas. Uh, we are installing lots and lots of windmills, which is pretty neat, uh, pretty cool. And uh, it's crazy how massive these are. So if you can't tell what's going on in this picture, this is a like a semi truck right here. And you can see that this is just one blade of the windmill and that it's so huge that they have to actually have two trucks to basically drive it around, uh, one in the back, one in the front. Uh, pretty insane. Um, I bet I can find a video that captures how enormous they are. Um, but closest ones I know of are over by Corpus Christi. Uh, they have uh, a few set up and uh, yeah, it's cool driving underneath them. They're just massive. Um, our next type of renewable energy is solar. Uh, uh, solar panels, I think we're all kind of familiar with. The idea is sunlight hits these and it generates electricity. Um, so there is no generator here. There's nothing spinning. Um, it's what is known as the photovoltaic effect. Certain kinds of materials, when sunlight hits them, it can interact with electrons. And remember, electric current is just electrons moving through a wire, typically. So basically, when sunlight hits this certain kind of material, uh, this panel, uh, it reacts with the electrons and gets them moving and will begin moving them in one direction. And so that's current. And so that's how uh, solar panels essentially work. Pretty neat technology. We'll talk more about them. And another uh, renewable resource, ooh, I hadn't even put this on the, the cover page, uh, biofuels, also kind of kind of similar to uh, photovoltaic panels in that uh, this is basically capturing the, the power of sunlight. Uh, so instead of using sunlight to hit a, a panel that's generating electricity, you're using sunlight to grow plants and algae uh, that you can actually turn into fuel. So plant sugars like corn, uh, you can basically refine corn and actually turn it into something called ethanol. It's a similar process as basically making alcohol and beer. Uh, ethanol is similar to that. So this refinery back here, basically in this picture you can see is how we create this. And this ethanol here is, you can put it in your car engine and it runs a, it runs pretty well. Uh, if you have too much ethanol in your gasoline, it can get a little bit gunky. And so real gasoline is generally preferred as a fuel by car enthusiasts. Uh, the little number um, next to the gasoline, like when you're buying gas, it says, I don't know what the numbers are, 89, 91, 93, whatever it is. Um, that represents the amount of sort of octane or the pure gasoline part. And then the idea is that um this is the percentage so um if we had 89 91 and 93 and that's the percentage gasoline pretty much the other percentage is what's what's ethanol so this 89 the lowest quality the cheapest one is like 11 percent ethanol uh 91 is you know nine percent 93 is seven percent ethanol and so you're actually paying and when you're paying premium prices for the higher number you're pre paying for less ethanol uh, in your gasoline. Um, plants uh, and other 
al and in particular algae, uh, like we see down here, uh, some of these can actually be used to create certain kinds of oils, and those oils can actually be essentially sort of modified and refined and also used as a fuel. Uh, something like biodiesel, I believe, is made, can be made this way. Um, it's pretty crazy. I remember a while back seeing a Mythbusters episode where uh, they were testing a myth about whether or not you could actually run your car off of vegetable oil. So instead of gasoline, you actually put vegetable oil in your car to make it run. And shockingly, it actually works. So if I can find that clip, I'll play it now. 33 and a third miles to the gallon on straight diesel. With the baseline sussed, next up is the used cooking oil. Ah, oh, look at that. Pure power. Pure power it may be, but will the car even start? ka -ching. The engine is purring perfectly. But if we don't meet again, I love you. They're off. Remember, this is unmodified French fry oil. The restaurants up and down the country chuck out. It seems to be running just fine. They do the laps and get an MPG of 30, which for something that didn't cost a dime is pretty darn impressive. Number one, I'm surprised and impressed that the car runs on just straight filtered used kitchen oil. But number two, the fuel efficiency, it's only 10% less than, you know, regular diesel fuel. Yeah, that's uh, cool. The other thing is we didn't make any modifications to this car. That means anybody who had a diesel car could just pour the stuff straight into the gas tank and it would run fine. Woo! Yeah, baby! Uh, so that, you know, that's an idea is that basically we can use sunlight to create some kind of plant product that then we can make an oil from that we can fuel things like cars with. Kind of neat. And there's a hodgepodge of other random kind of energy resources that maybe we use very tiny bits around the world of uh, geothermal. The idea is that Earth, uh, at certain points in the Earth, uh, particularly areas with like lots of volcanoes and hot springs, uh, you can capture that heat and that steam. You can use that steam as it's wanting to rise up to basically spin a turbine. Uh, tidal energy is more conceptual, but the, the idea is that you kind of make a under Luna, you kind of make an underwater windmill, <laughs> uh, basically an ocean uh, kind of propeller looking thing underwater. And every day, if you live on the coast, you, you know that the tide comes in, a tide goes out, and there's this rush of water going in, sometimes very powerfully, sometimes kind of weakly. Uh, and we'll talk some about tides later on in the in the course, but uh, the idea is that as the water is moving this way, uh, it spins these turbines, and as it moves out, it spins them the other way, and you could get a lot of energy potentially from the tides each day. Uh, it's a pretty cool technology, except when you start considering that this all has to be built underwater in a saltwater environment with a bunch of barnacles and algae and all that stuff growing and things rusting and all that stuff. Um, pretty challenging environment to have a lot of moving parts in. Uh, not impossible, but eh. uh, so uh, to my knowledge, this is really not much beyond just kind of the conceptual stage at this point. And another one that's used a bit, but not much, is um, basically uh, uh, capturing wave energy. We know there's lots of waves in the ocean, uh, and the waves are moving things up and down. And so that movement up and down of like a buoy out in the ocean, that bob up and down, you can basically capture that energy as well uh, into electricity. All right, so that uh, covers basically the uh, the types of renewable resources that we have, energy resources. Um, there could be some other obscure ones that people are working on, but those are the main ones. Um, and now we're gonna shift to how much we actually use renewable in, uh, energy resources compared to non-renewables. All right, this lovely pie chart should look familiar if you did uh, the last activity where you guys made this one, but this is basically global energy consumption by source. And this was, I believe the year was 2018, so it might be slightly different compared to now. Um, but you can see uh, the biggest chunk of the world's energy consumption is oil. 
followed closely by coal, followed closely by natural gas. Uh, and then the next one after that is biofuels, mainly wood. So people burning wood for, for heating, not so much for electricity or any kind of fuel, uh, but basically just burning firewood and for cooking and things like that. Uh, and then the next one's the nuclear. And then hydro is the next. And then wind and solar, everything else fits into, uh, you know, geothermal and tidal and all that stuff fits into that tiny little orange slice. Um, basically, if we're talking about non-renewable versus renewable, the non-renewables are oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear. And you can see that these combined make up the majority of this pie. Uh, and the percentage changes, but it's 85, 90% of the pie is basically non-renewable resources. Those are things that we're going to run out uh, that potentially within our lifetimes are going to become more and more scarce. And so really we need to grow this piece of pie uh, that is renewables down here, this tiny little piece. It also kind of begs the question of, okay, I mean, we just learned about all these resources. They seem pretty neat. Like, why don't we use more renewables already? I mean, how did the world get to be this point where we use so much non-renewables uh, compared to renewables? After all, the non-renewables ones are going to run out, but they also, if you recall, uh, contribute to all kinds of pollution, uh, whereas the renewables are, are generally better. So how do we end up in this situation? The answer to that question is very, very complicated. It has multiple aspects of it, and I'm going to go through some of the details of kind of the, the best that I can summarize uh, why we use so many non-renewables. But I will say that the, the renewable slice has been growing um, in my lifetime a bit. Uh, this orange slice used to be much smaller. Uh, it has quadrupled in size in the last 20 or so years. So it used to be a tinier little slice like this or something like that, a little tiny sliver. And now it's, you know, it's still pretty tiny, but it's sizably bigger. Um, so there has been some progress, but not. Uh, overwhelming amount of progress in the last 20 years. So let's talk a little bit about why. So I think in the, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you could say it came down to money. Uh, it was just simply cheaper and more easy and efficient to use non-renewable resources compared to renewables. Um, nowadays, it's actually not as much of an issue with money. Um, so the cost of wind and solar energy in particular have come down a lot. Um, this is just solar pricing. So the price of basically solar panels, how much it costs to produce electricity. And you can see that this is going down pretty steeply uh, in the last, this is just in the last five years, but it is kind of flat aligning. It's, uh, you know, it's still going down, but it's not going down at the rate it, it used to. Um, and so it's kind of approaching, it's flattening or uh, asymptote in, uh, in math is, is what that's called. Uh, so yeah, it's likely not gonna obviously go, keep going down forever. The solar panels are always gonna cost something, but you can see that the costs do go down over time, but are kind of flattening. Um, and at the costs they currently are at, they're actually pretty competitive with uh, non-renewables. So if you want to make, and expand uh, the amount of electricity you're producing. Um, you have some options like, oh, I can I can build a new power plant for natural gas and some more wells and uh, some more refineries, or I could invest in solar or wind. And actually nowadays, uh, the price is pretty comparable. Uh, and I, in Texas, wind is actually the cheapest energy uh, to create nowadays. Um, so, most of the new installations to produce more electricity in Texas are wind. Um, so that's all good news. Um, however, and this is the big however, when we're talking about the cost, we're talking about new installations and we already have lots of power plants already in place and also lots of refineries and uh, drilling sites and all that stuff already in place for things like natural gas, uh, coal, power plants, coal mines, all that stuff. And so a lot of the kind of upfront costs have already been paid uh, 
for natural gas. So it's not like solar is so cheap that we're going to, you know, demolish all of our refineries and existing power plants and replace them with solar uh, because solar is just so much cheaper even than than just maintaining these. No, no, no. Uh, once you have all this stuff built already, uh, this is still considerably cheaper to use. Um, so yes, new projects are typically going to be solar and renewable, but a lot of the old existing projects still make up the majority of our energy consumption. So that's one way is that it still kind of comes down to money. Um, and it's it's good news that it's gotten so much cheaper and that new projects can be wind and solar, but there are already so many existing infrastructure in place that is built for non-renewables that we're going to keep using it for quite some time uh, if we're only going by cost. Let's say hypothetically, as we move forward in the future, um, as these refineries and power plants degrade, we're not building new ones, that as they are falling apart and being decommissioned, we're investing in more and more solar and more and more wind. Um, there does become an issue with energy density. Um, the space requirements for um, solar in particular are massive. So if we want to switch more to uh, uh, solar energy, let's say we want to transition from oil and gas over to solar, uh, you can do the calculation. One of these oil wells produces some uh, some of the more productive ones, two, 300 barrels of oil per day, uh, and a lot of oil. To kind of match that energy output, you need about 23 acres worth of solar panels, and an acre is about the size of a football field, um, or is it a soccer field? It's big. So 23 big, big, big football fields full of solar panels basically to equate, equal basically just one of these tiny little wells. Um, when you start looking at how many of these wells we built to satisfy our ener energy needs, the perspective of how many solar panels we would need to create to replace this begins to be mind boggling. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that by a little quick uh, look at Google Maps. All right, so here I am in Google Maps and I'm in the satellite mode. Here's Texas. Uh, we want to see the border. There's the border. And we're going to look over here at uh, kind of West Texas over by Midland and Odessa. These are big oil country over here. And we're going to just sort of look at how many oil wells there are there to satisfy our energy needs currently. So as you begin zooming in on this part of the map over kind of north of Odessa, you start seeing. Um, this kind of weird checkerboard, this weird white stuff. Uh, and it's outside of the city. Those are, you know, I would, normally I would think that's like houses or roads or something, but as you zoom in more and more, what is this? It's like alien markings or something. And as you zoom in more and more, what, in the, what are these things? What are all these marks out here? And as you zoom in, You see this kind of patch. Let's see if we can go to street mode here. Let's see what these things are. So as you look out from the highway, you can see every one of those little white patches. There's a little oil well there. There's another one there, and that's what all those are. Every single one of these little marks on the earth is an oil well. And you go, wow. That's a lot of oil. Now, I think a lot of these wells have actually dried up because we've run out of a lot of the oil in this region has already dried up. Uh, but you can imagine. At one point, they were all pumping lots and lots of oil that we were using. If you want to replace all of this with solar. Every single one of these oil wells would need 23 acres of solar panels to match its energy output. And. If you do the calculation for the entire world, if we wanted to transition all of our energy resources over to solar, we would need to cover a huge chunk of the United States with solar. I mean, pretty much the entirety of the Southwest desert would have to be covered in solar panels. We're talking thousands of square miles. And when we talk about scaling up something like solar to meet the energy demands of the entire world, 
you know, the, the entire earth might end up looking a little bit like a disco ball by the time we're done with it. Certainly that is a consideration. And there are some similar issues with, with wind turbines. A uh, wind turbine could potentially match the energy output of something like an oil well um, pretty easily. So a big wind turbine. Um, but you can imagine a landscape where every one of those these oil wells is replaced by a massive wind turbine. I mean, that would be quite something. I mean, I would not want to be a bird <laughs> living in that area. It would be like a very treacherous place to live. <laughs> there would be massive blades uh, spinning everywhere. Um, so it is definitely something to think about is like it, if we're wanting to grow this orange slice of the pie, bigger and bigger and bigger what is the world going to look like if we somehow grow this orange slice to be as big and to completely cover this entire pie chart uh it's going to be i don't know it's a bit hard to imagine uh and hydro there are similar issues as well uh, let me show you what i mean by that this video is going to show you the number of dams uh, built in the united states from the year 1800 to present day um, so let's see what this pattern looks like. And then remember, uh, dams are basically what create electricity from water. So you can see in the 1800s, we have a few building, um, but pretty much limited to East Coast. Uh, we're getting more and more. By 1900 now, you know, Americans have pretty much colonized everywhere. And then, oh my gosh, once you get into the 1900s, oh. By the end of it, uh, the American rivers are already completely full of dams. I mean, there are just so many dams already in existence that, I mean, theoretically we could build more, but there's really no more space. Like there, every river that could have been blocked has been blocked at this point in the United States. You know, a situation could arise where that happens with solar and wind as well. If we look at a, a map of the United States, this actually shows us where the wind blows the strongest and basically the areas that are uh, purplish in color, this kind of big uh, middle of the America, uh, we call this Tornado Alley. Um, this is where wind speeds are the highest on average in America. And this would be the biggest, you know, this would be the area that uh, windmills and wind turbines would work the best. Um, so we could potentially get to a point where we've packed this area pretty full of, of wind turbines and, and similar to our, our hydroelectric dams, uh, there's just not really anywhere else that we can really put them. Uh, we could get to a, a point like that. Uh, and the same goes with solar. Uh, the southwest corner of the United States is great for solar. There's a lot of sunlight there. It's very dry. There's not many clouds. Uh, a lot of other areas in the United States have much uh, weaker potential for solar energy um, and you know yes we might be able to fill this area up with lots and lots of solar panels but at some point is it going to get to be so full that that solar panels we've really built basically built as many as we can there's also the issue that to move electricity through a power line the longer the power line is the more electricity you kind of lose in the process a little bit of heat gets generated as it's traveling through this wire and that's it's called resistance so you might have learned about it in physics last year and so there is another issue let's say that we've packed you know arizona and new mexico uh full of solar panels and we want to power the entire united states using solar panels from this region um it becomes really really hard to move that electricity all the way across the country over up here to maine uh, so much electricity would be lost in the process that we really need some viable solution up here in Maine. In our own neck of the woods, Houston, it's kind of interesting. Um, Houston is reasonably sunny. I think we're in kind of in the middle here. Um, but we have a lot of cloudy days and we have a lot of rainfall here in Houston. Uh, and there might be a bit of air pollution and stuff that kind of blocks out the sunlight. Uh, so it's not as intense here. Um, so solar is kind of mediocre here. If we look at our wind map, this is where we are. Uh, we're pretty mediocre on wind too. So, you know, if we're trying to 
somehow invest entirely in, in renewables and we're going to pack the middle of the country up with windmills and we're going to pack Arizona up with solar panels, well, there's still a lot of areas that don't have access to any renewable energy. And what are those areas going to do? On the topic of kind of energy density, uh, there's something else that comes up with transportation. Um, all of these things, the main renewables that we have access to are all generating electricity, but they're not like a fuel that you can use to drive a plane or a car or a semi truck or a giant boat. Those all run off of gasoline and, and diesel and actual fuels, not electricity. We can make batteries, but these batteries are really, really heavy compared to the amount of electricity they actually produce uh, and the amount of energy they actually produce and hold on to. So there's no way to hook electricity or solar panels directly up to this boat. I mean, it would have to be tugging along many, many acres of solar panels to power it. So somehow we have to bring the energy along with us in the boat, the electricity, and the only way to do that is really a battery. Um, for perspective on this kind of energy density issue is uh, I drive a Toyota Corolla. When I fill up my gas tank, again, my car has to, the gasoline in my car not only powers it to move, but it also carries itself. Uh, so being really lightweight as a fuel is, has really big advantages for something like a car. Uh, my gas tank, when it's completely full, weighs only about 75 pounds. So it's really not having to carry that much weight around um, for itself. It's a very dense energy. A, an equivalent Tesla battery uh, that could basically give uh, a Tesla car the equivalent range of my 75 pound gas tank full of gasoline uh, would need to weigh about 2,000 pounds. So let me say that again. To make a battery that can hold enough electricity to move a car about 400 miles, which is how far my Toyota Corolla can drive, uh, that battery would have to weigh about 2,000 pounds to move my car that far, whereas my gas tank only weighs 75 pounds. So that's a lot of energy loss just carrying yourself. Uh, another way to think about this is that, let's say we wanted to have a battery powered cargo ship. So this is normally powered by diesel, it has a big gas tank in here that carries a bunch of diesel and that's what fuels it as it moves across the ocean. If we want to create a ship that can move across the ocean only using electricity that we're getting from wind and solar because we have to do all renewable, um, you know, a huge chunk of this ship would have to be a battery, basically. And this is really important for something like a cargo ship to have as much space as it possibly can because you want to fill it up with cargo. So if we had to move to 100% solar and wind power for the world and we wanted to power our ships with solar and wind, they would all become considerably less efficient at actually moving things around the world. So that's a current challenge. Batteries are getting smaller and more efficient, but you know they definitely have a long, long way to go. I will mention here that I, I did mention biofuels. Uh, biofuels maybe would be a better solution to this issue of energy density and transportation because you can make a biofuel that is as potent as gasoline or close to as potent as gasoline and uh, biodiesels that are almost as good as the, the, the real stuff. And potentially that would be a better solution to transportation issues and renewables. Um, however, similar to solar panels, the amount of these ponds that you would have to make to grow all this algae uh, would be massive uh, in scale. And another really big issue with um, electricity made by renewables like solar and wind is what happens to solar on a cloudy day or what happens to wind energy if the wind stops blowing for a while. Um, right now, when I turn on a light switch or my heater or my air conditioning or, or whatever, that electricity is there on demand. And I can count on it being there 
for the most part, unless there's a crazy winter storm that knocks out the power grid. Uh, but with renewables, if the wind's not blowing uh, and the sun's not shining, it's cloudy and, and it's stagnant in terms of the air, and I turn on my light, uh, if the if the solar the sun's not shining and everybody's trying to turn on their lights in the whole you know grid, uh, there's just not going to be any electricity there for them. So this means that when the sun is shining really really bright, you're only, you're going to potentially have too much electricity and too much energy. It's not really it's going to be too much of a supply. And then at times where it's cloudy and not windy, you're going to have too little electricity. And non-renewables are really good at generating energy on demand. Um, if you know it's going to be a cold night and a lot of people are going to be running your heaters, you can run your power plants a little bit hotter and generate more electricity to meet that demand uh, in real time. The same with a really, really hot day and you know everybody's going to run their air conditionings. You know, you can do that. Whereas with renewals, you, you wouldn't have to. And so what probably would have to happen is that we would need lots and lots and lots of batteries either in everybody's home or some massive battery grid um, that could store excess energy when the sun was really bright and shining and could um, meet the demand when the, the sun isn't shining and isn't bright. So that just adds a lot to the cost of renewables. Right now, when we're talking about comparing costs of, of new wind and solar panels and stuff, we're just comparing just the solar panels and wind installation, not anything about installing batteries for everybody. When you start factoring in those costs, there's no way that renewables can be as effective as non-renewables, even today. And last but not least, some aspects of renewable energy are actually non-renewable. Um, two of the ingredients that we're using in the most modern day batteries right now are lithium and cobalt. This is a, these are metals that are mined from the ground and the earth only has so much of them. So it's not like the sun makes these metals or something. They're deposited in the earth and there's only so many. And if we're talking about trying to transition the world entirely to electricity powered by wind and solar, uh, we would definitely get to a point where these metals basically ran out as we're trying to make all these batteries that are gonna power our boats, our cars, our trucks, our planes, our houses, all this stuff. Uh, there's just not enough of them. Maybe we can figure out something else to make batteries out of. That's kind of the situation. So as we can see, renewables are, are really neat. Um, I myself am looking into putting solar panels in my house and, and trying to reduce my uh, consumption of non-renewable resources and becoming more self-sufficient and all that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, trying to imagine a world that is completely transitioned to renewables, wind and solar, because hydro, we don't really have room for anymore. I'm not sure if that world can actually work out without pretty massive changes having to happen in terms of the amount of energy we actually consume. That might not be a big deal, but our current kind of lifestyles and economy and financial system and everything depends on continual growth and growing more and more and more. And transitioning to renewables probably is going to entail the opposite. And I'm not sure the world is really ready for that uh, because I, I just don't see the amount of energy that we're consuming based off non-renewables, it just doesn't seem like it's viably going to be replaced by renewables anytime soon, or it might not even be possible at all. Um, so that's kind of the situation in the world. And I will elaborate more on that in the next YouTube video, which is going to be about energy economics. So see you later.